Our first lesson comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us, none can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O oh Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O oh Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever.
Our second lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter beginning at the first verse. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Join me in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about in the Cortland area, but yesterday's snow in Manlius, at least in the morning, was particularly beautiful. It came down gently and abundantly and sort of covered everything with a about three inches of white fluffy stuff. It reminded me of that first winter that I spent in upstate New York, and it reminded me of a letter I got from a friend back in Pennsylvania who wanted to keep in touch and see how I was doing up in the North Country, as he called it. And he sent me an article he had read, a humorous article, a fictional article, about a person who had moved from the Deep South to upstate New York. And it, the article was in the form of this man's diary as he, as he looked forward to the coming of winter. He had never spent a, a winter with snow. And so he recorded in his diary how anxious he was for that first snowfall and to see its beauty and to experience it like a, a native upstate New Yorker. Well, that first snowstorm came and the diary describes it with great detail. He took long walks. He took pictures of how it lay on the the pine tree and the birds of the bird feeder. And he relished even the shoveling of the driveway. He came in with rosy cheeks and described how he sat down with a, a cup of hot chocolate. The next day's entry says it snowed again. And the third day's entry say it had snowed again. And then there was references to ice and slush and being wet and cold. And then there were references to his sore back from shoveling the driveway. And then a week later there was a reference, I've purchased a snowblower. (laughs) By the end of that diary in the end of the winter, we had a bitter, angry, person on the edge of snow madness, lashing out at families, neighbors, God, and snow. What made, I think, that article was so funny to me, we can all relate to it. Winter is sometimes a difficult and emotional time for a lot of folks. We have shorter daylight hours. It's cold, sometimes very cold. Sometimes hard to get around, and especially if we have some trouble walking The snow just seems to mess up everything. We're limited, but to the most part, to indoor activities, and we begin to get cabin fever, the reason so many that are able head south. And it's sort of like getting drawn into a deep and dark pit, to use the language of the psalmist in Psalm 40, where he talks about a desolate pit and a miry bog looking for something to keep him secure. 
You know, the, the, the Psalms in the Old Testament were, were the hymns of worship of the Jewish people. We've lost the tunes, but the words remain. And like our hymns of today, they give expression to a wide variety of human emotions, gratitude, praise, fear, frustration, anger, hope. Often the psalms that we call the psalms of lament begin with the author bringing before God and the people concerns about something in his or her life, a wrong that's been done, a physical illness, an injury, something, uh, an invading army. And when those petitions are offered, the psalmist usually concludes with a word of thanksgiving and praise for what God has done in response to that petition. Psalm 40 is different. It begins with thanksgiving, and that's the, the first 11 verses that uh, Donna read for us this morning. But it ends with a lament, with a concern, because life is not always an upward spiral. It sometimes has its ups and, it down, and its downs. Psalm 40 begins by sharing that the psalmist was in a dark place in his life. He was in a desolate pit or a miry bog. We don't know whether he had a physical illness or injury, but it sounds a lot like he was depressed. Depression is like being in a pit that you struggle to climb out of, or in a bog which seems to grab at your feet, slowing you down to almost a crawl and threatens to draw you down into its depths. In the midst of his trials, whether they were physical or mental, the psalmist was patient. And so he writes, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, you know, being patient is not easy, especially when it comes to illness or depression. We want things to get better and we want, the, want them to get better quickly. And it's hard to be patient when you're hurting. It's also hard to be patient in a world that is pretty much impatient. We want everything to happen and we want it to happen now. The old joke, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. But the psalmist waited for the Lord and he rejoices that God heard his prayer and came to help drew him up out of his pit, set him on a rock that made his feet feel secure. In other words, he found something in his life that gave him an anchor, something that enabled him to cope with those times of depression. And we know that holding on to something today helps those who struggle with depression. For this psalmist, he also found that God gave him a new song for his heart, a new way of expressing his faith. His heart was lifted, and in that song, he found that he could trust God. And I think we can't underestimate the importance of trust. Trusting God enables us, I think, to face the challenges that approach us. Trust in each other gives us that kind of support and care that enables us to get through dark days. And as we trust, the psalmist says, we will find happiness. Now, happiness, as the psalmist uses the word, is not just feeling good or enjoying things. It's not all smiles and all roses and not having a care in the world. Rather, when the psalmist uses that word, he's using the word asher in Hebrew which means a sense of peace in your heart, something that's steady and enduring, something that gives us a sense of well-being, something that comes only from our God who loves us. It's in response to this sense of well-being that the psalmist can give praise and thanksgiving to God and to have an open ear to the voice of God. For God does not seek sacrifices and offerings, as the psalmist writes, 
but an ear that's not been destroyed and not been clogged by the debris of life. God seeks God's law to be written not on a book, but on the walls of our hearts. And also he calls upon us to live out God's law, to live out God's way, to let that song be heard. And that's not bad advice for us all, to listen for that voice of God, to clear away all those things which may obstruct our hearing, and to be those who live out our faith in our daily lives, to share our t the testimony of what God has done for us in our, in our community of faith, in our families, in our workplaces, at school or wherever. This is the new song that we hear, a song of hope, a song to be shared. For if we just maintain it within ourselves, it becomes static and ingrown. Faith is shared, faith that is shared is a lively faith that nourishes both the one who tells it and the one who receives it. May we all have open ears, listening and sharing the good news, the good new song that God has brought into our lives. Amen.